Okay, today we're going to be talking about 1.1 solving equations. And our essential question is how do we solve equations and justify the process? You have probably been solving equations in one way or another since elementary school. But what we really want to focus on today is not just the process of how to solve and really getting into more complicated problems to solve than you may have seen before, but really the foundation behind why we're allowed to do the different steps that we do when we solve. So this first part is sort of, I would say, if we were watching a court TV show, this is like all the evidence that we're going to log in. And if you've ever seen a TV show like the one I'm talking about, after you log things into, into evidence, you sort of show that it's allowed to be used. After that point in time, you can just use it by name. Like you could refer to evidence number 1.2, which shows that this guy had the murder weapon in his house. Um, but here we're saying after we show and establish these properties, we're allowed to reference them in any of the problems after this point. And I'll show you why that's important after we go through the properties. So the first property is the addition property of equality. And what this property basically says in words is that you're allowed to add something as long as you add it on both sides of the equation. So here it's algebraically. If A equals B, then A plus C equals B plus C. So let's think about this in terms of numbers. We know that 3 is equal to three. That makes sense, everything is equal to itself. That's actually this reflexive property down here. So we're gonna actually write that in right there. Anything is the same as itself, the reflexive property. So the addition property says, if these two things are the same, I'm allowed to add a number as long as I add it on both sides and as long as I'm adding the same number. That's the addition property. Think about what we're doing. We're adding two on both sides. We're allowed to do that because of the addition property. And this is true. We know that the left-hand side would be equal to five and the right-hand side would be equal to five. The same thing holds true with subtraction. If, I, if A is equal to B, then A minus C is equal to B minus C. So I'm gonna use three again. Three is my favorite number, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> so if three is equal to three, then I could subtract two on both sides and I would still have a statement that is equal. Three minus two is one, three minus two is one. It's going to be the same. So we are allowed to add and subtract as long as we do it on both sides and as long as we are adding and subtracting the same number. I think I remember being told, do unto one side as you do unto, unto the other, like the math golden rule. The same thing you're gonna see hold with, addition, with multiplication and division, so if A equals B, then A times some number C could equal B times some number C. So if three equals three, then I could also multiply this by two and multiply this by two, and I still have the same thing. The same property holds with division. If three, ooh, I'm gonna have to write really small. If three equals three, then three over two equals three over two. One and a half does equal one and a half. This next one, I'm going to put a little smiley face next to because I feel like whenever whoever taught you guys this for the first time just totally nailed it because this is one that most of the time I don't see any issues with at all except maybe for multiplying wrong or having a number wrong. But this is the one everybody always remembers. The distributive property says that if you have a number in front of parentheses, so a number being multiplied by a quantity, in this case, A is the number, B plus C is the quantity, what you can actually do is just multiply A by each individual piece of the quantity. So A times B plus A times C, and the same thing holds with subtraction. Let's look at this with numbers, and again, this is gonna look a little bit weird, I think, just because why would we have numbers like this, right? PEMDAS says that we could just add this and we should get nine, but let's see what happens if we multiply. Three times two is gonna give me six, three times one is gonna give me three, which if I simplified is nine, and that should make sense. If I added first, two plus one is three, three times three is nine. So these statements are the same. The substitution property, the word substitution in math means the same thing that the word substitution means anywhere. When I'm watching sports, substitution happens when one player goes in for another player. 
I used to play and coach volleyball and substitutions happen in a very clear way. One person stands right next to the other person. You see them exchange places. It's very clear this person is going in to take the place of this other person. In other sports, it happens a little bit more quickly. In football and basketball and soccer, sometimes it's just one person exchanging places, but sometimes it happens so fast that it's hard to even tell. But substitutions took place. In a normal school situation, when I am not there, there is a substitute there, someone that comes in to take the place of something else. The same thing is true in math. If A is equal to B, then B can be substituted in or plugged in anywhere that there is an A in an expression or an equation. So if we said that X equals two, nope, let's stick with three. I like three. If X equals three, then three X is really the same thing as saying three times three. I can substitute this value in for any X in a, in a problem. If I know that they're the same, I can use one in the place of the other. We talked about the reflexive property. Everything is the same as itself. Everything is equal to itself. The symmetric property is one that you use all the time without even realizing it. What I mean by that is sometimes when I get to the end of the problem, the way that I solved it, my X is on the right hand side and I have three equals X. And for whatever reason, I just don't like the way that that looks. I would rather it look like this. And what I just did without even knowing was I used the symmetric property. The symmetric property says that if A is equal to B, then B is equal to A. So I can switch the order or I can switch what is on each side of the equal side and I still have an equal or an equivalent expression. The last problem, or the, sorry, the last property is the transitive property. And the transitive property is the most complicated one to explain, but again, it's something that you probably it, it makes sense when you think about it. So if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. Oh my goodness, that was a lot of math language, wasn't it? So what we're saying, if two things are the same as a third thing, then the original two things are the same. So let's try and think about this in an example that makes more sense than just looking at a bunch of variables on a page. If Abby and Zoe are the same age, and Zoe and Jacob are the same age, then we can say that Abby and Jacob are the same age. Because if Abby and Zoe are the same age, and Zoe and Jacob are the same age, really what we're saying is that all three of these things are the same value. So that's what this property is saying. If x equals 3 and y equals 3, then x equals y. The last thing that we're logging into evidence, or that we're going to allow ourselves to use, it's kind of snug down here on the bottom, but it's combining like terms. It's not officially a property or it's maybe a combination of some properties, but we're allowed to do things like combine 3x and 5x to say that that is 8x or combine 3 and 2 to say that that is 5. That's combining like terms, putting together things that are already the same. So these are our properties. Now that we have identified them and come to an understanding of what they mean, we're allowed to use them without having to come up with some proof about why they work. Now let's look, about, look at how we can use them to our benefit. So what does it mean to solve and justify? It means that we are gonna do all of the math to get to our solution, and then we're gonna state along the way why we're allowed to do that. So again, if you think about the courtroom scenario, when someone is trying to tell the story of what happened, they're not only saying this is what happened, the statement, but they're saying this is how we know that that happened, the reason, the justification, or the why. So the way you're always going to start is you're just going to take the original problem and you're going to rewrite it. How do I know that y divided by 3 plus 6 is 2? I know that because it was given to me in the problem. <laughs> They told me it was true, and that's why I'm starting there. Now, remember that when you're solving, and I'm going to show some of the work up here. When you're solving an equation, the goal when we're solving is to isolate the variable, to get everything that's around the variable all by itself so we can figure out what that variable is. So in this case, our variable is y. And there's a few things that are making it so that y cannot be by itself. There's a 6 and there's a 3. The 3 and the y are dividing. The 6 and the y over 3 are adding. 
So I want to think about how I can undo those things, how I can reverse those operations. So what I'm thinking is if I have y over 3 plus 6 and I don't want that plus 6 there, I want that plus 6 to go away, what I want to do is subtract 6, right? Because 6 and minus 6 is going to give me 0. Now, wait a second. I can't just throw a minus 6 in there because I feel like that's a great idea. I have to do it to the other side. Now we're okay, because what do we just do? We just use the subtraction property of equality, which I'm gonna put down here, subtraction property of equality. What's left when we do this? When we do this, we're left with y over three, we didn't do anything to that, but there's no more plus six. This became zero. Two minus six, I can combine over there, that's gonna give me negative four. Okay, so now I have y over 3 equals negative 4. I need to get rid of the thing that's preventing y from being by itself, and that thing is 3. So what are y and 3 doing? They're dividing. There's a fraction. There's division happening. How do I undo that division? Well, the opposite or the inverse operation of dividing is multiplying. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 3. When I do that, these two are going to divide, and I'm just going to have y left. And over here, negative 4 times 3 is going to give me negative 12. So that means this we just solved is that y equals negative 12. What, and now I'm thinking, wait, what was the reason? What, how am I telling the jury or how am I telling you guys that I'm allowed to do what I just did? Well, what did I do on both sides? I multiplied on both sides. So that's the multiplication property of equality. Now, in Algebra 1, we really like for you to use fancy set notation around that. And I'm going to redraw one of those so that you can see what it looks like. It's sort of a little squiggle. But it's called set notation. And I'll explain another day why that's so important to us. But for right now, we would just appreciate if you put those little brackets, braces around your answers. So let's rework or let's work through some more problems so you can see that process of solve and justify while we review and reteach some ideas about solving equations in general. So again, Every time I start a problem where I'm solving and justifying, the very first thing I'm going to do is rewrite the problem. And the reason I'm allowed to do that is because that problem was given to me. Then I'm going to think about how to isolate my variable. So I'm thinking, I'm going to sort of have scratch work thinking up here. I'm trying to think about if I want this 4x or I want x in the end to be all by itself. How do I get it by itself? Well, the first thing I need to do is get rid of this plus one. What's the opposite or the inverse operation of adding one? Well, that's going to be subtracting one, which means before I even do the math, I actually already know the property. The property is the subtraction property of equality. What do I get when I do that? Well, this is going to become 0, 1 minus 1. So on the left-hand side of the equal sign, I just have 4x. And on the right-hand side of the equal sign, 13 minus 1 is going to give me 12. Now I have 4 and x. 4 is being multiplied by x to undo multiplication. I'm going to divide. So what I'm really thinking about is now I'm dividing by x. And that's going to give me that x equals 3. And again, I'm going to put, oops, I should be dividing by 4. Those 4s divide away. 12 divided by 4 is 3. I'm going to put that fancy set notation. And then my reason, well, what did I do? I divided. Why am I allowed to do that? To the division property. Same thing on number 2. Negative 12 minus m equals 16. My reason is that this is given. I want to isolate m, so I want to get rid of that negative 12. So how do I get rid of 12? I add, or how do I get rid of negative 12? I'm going to add 12 on both sides. That means on the left, this is going to become 0, so all that's left is negative m. And on the right-hand side, 16 plus 12 is going to give me 28. And I don't have enough space, so I'm going to abbreviate addition property. 
is what allowed me to do that. And that doesn't really, there we go. Now it looks like an eight. Now I want, I want to know what M is. This statement right here basically says the opposite of M is 28. Negative M is 28. So if if the opposite of M is 28, then M has to be negative 28. Or you can think that what we're doing is either multiplying or dividing both sides by negative 1. So that's going to give me that M equals, fancy set notation, negative 28. And I used division, so I'm going to say the division property of equality. So go ahead and pause this video. See if you can work through any of three, four, and five. Maybe pick the one to start that you think looks the most straightforward. And then unpause the video and see how you did. So number three, and I, I ran out of room. I'm not going to have enough room to do these problems. So I'm going to write given next to the problem up top. But pretend that my statement and reason is, is above all that. So what we have here on number three is three times the quantity x plus eight equals negative nine. And there's two ways that you could solve this problem. I'm gonna solve it the way I think that most of you would have solved it, but I'm also gonna explain the other way for those of you that, that noticed something to start with. So typically, when we see parentheses and a number in front, our gut says distribute, multiply that three out. That is a totally acceptable way to do this. So what did we just do here? We distributed. So that was the distributive property of equality. Actually, the distributive property of multiplication over addition. You can just call it the distributive property. Now, I want to isolate x. So I have 3x plus 24. I want to get rid of plus 24. So I'm going to subtract 24 on both sides, meaning I already know my reason. My reason is the subtraction property. If I subtract 24 on the left, then I'm going to get 0 with my numbers. That was the point, so that we only had 3x on the left-hand side. If I subtract 21 on the right, negative 9 and negative, sorry, 24. If I subtract 24 on the right, negative 9 and negative 24 is going to give me negative 33. So remember, when two numbers are negative, you add them and keep the negative sign. Now, to solve for x, to get x by itself, I'm going to divide both sides by 3. And when I divide both sides by 3, I get that x equals negative 11. And what did I do? I divided. So that's the division property. Now, I want you to think, I'm going to go to a blank slide because I want to show you another way that you could solve this problem without distributing first. So if I have this problem three times the, times the quantity x plus eight, what I'm doing is multiplying. And we could actually undo that multiplication without distributing, we could undo that multiplication by dividing. So I could divide both sides by three. If I did that over here, those two threes are gonna divide to be one. Three divided by three is one. So all that's left over here is x plus 8. Over here, negative 9 divided by 3 is negative 3. So if I was doing the proof, this first part was given. What did we do? We divided, so the division property. And then now all I have to do is get rid of the 8. I can subtract 8 on both sides. We're going to get the exact same answer, so subtraction property. But it was a step fewer. Now I want you to think this method of dividing first made sense because this number evenly divided by this number. If instead of a 9, this was a 19, there's no way I want to start the problem that way because 9, 19 doesn't divide evenly by 3 and then I'm going to get stuck with fractions at the beginning of the problem. You don't have to do it this way, but it's a great option to really get you thinking and shortening the amount of steps that need to be done. So I'm going to go quickly through these last two. P over 5 plus 10 equals 100. That was given. I'm going to subtract 10 on both sides. That's going to give me P over 5 equals 100. Not 100. I subtracted 10. So that should be 90. The reason that I'm allowed to do that is the subtraction property. And then to get rid of this divided by 5, I'm going to multiply both sides by 5. So that's going to get rid of the 5 in the denominator. 90 times 5, well, 9 times 5 is 45. So 90 times 5 is 450. And what do we do? We used the multiplication property of equality. 
All right, I'm gonna try and squeeze this number five down here. I apologize if it gets messy. Four Y minus Y plus three is 24. That's given. The first thing I'm gonna do is combine those Y's. I'm allowed to do that and I'm gonna abbreviate this, combine like terms, is the reason I'm allowed to say that four Y minus Y is three Y. Then I wanna move plus three to the other side, so I'm gonna subtract three. That's gonna give me three Y is 21. What did I just do? I subtracted. Then I'm gonna divide by three to isolate Y, and I'm gonna get that Y equals seven. What did I do? I divided, so that's the division property. Ah, sorry, of equality. So you only have to do this justification or this table, this statement and reason process when the directions say solve and justify. And if I just spent so long going over this part with you, you should assume that you're gonna have to solve and justify. Sometimes you're not always gonna have to solve and justify. So let's just work through some solving problems. And if you're looking at these problems six through nine and you feel like, Judson, I don't even need you to talk me through these problems, then go ahead and pause the video and work through them on your own and see how you did. Because if you don't need to, then hey, save yourself the time and just make sure that you're doing it correctly. So on number six, the very first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna distribute my four. That's gonna give me 4y plus 32, plus 32 minus seven equals 15 plus two y. Now I'm gonna combine like terms. So see, I'm still using those reasons, even if I'm not doing the two column setup, I'm mentally thinking about how I can use those. That's gonna give me 4y plus 25 equals 15 plus two y. Now I want all my y's to be on the left, so I'm gonna get rid of this two y by subtracting two y on both sides. That's gonna make my four y become a two y plus 25 equals 15. I'm gonna get rid of 25 by subtracting 25 on both sides. 15 minus 25, so that's gonna give me negative 10. I'm subtracting and the bigger number is being subtracted. So 2y is equal to negative 10. To get rid of the 2 in front of the y, I can divide it. So my final answer is going to be y equals negative 5. I know that number 7 is automatically scary because it has a fraction. And that just, in general, freaks a lot of people out. And I hope by the end of the year that when you see fractions, they don't freak you out. Because I love fractions. But... Ignoring the fraction temporarily, the first thing I want to do is get all my y's on the same side. So I'm going to subtract 3y on both sides. If I subtract 3y from 6y, I get 3y. So 3y minus 1 third, I want that to be a different color, that's the thing that we changed, is equal to 19. Now here's... Here's the thing, I've moved all my y's to the right and now I have this one third and this one third is making it really hard. I know that I'm gonna have 19 plus one third if I added it on both sides. But right now I just, I kinda wanna make this fraction go away. I know how scared you guys sometimes can be of fractions, so let's just get rid of it. The way that we can get rid of a fraction in a problem or that we can make it go away is by multiplying by that denominator or multiplying by the common denominator. In this case, if I just multiply everything by three, then this one third, when I, you can think about it sort of like distributing, when I multiply one third by three, remember one third times three over one, when we're multiplying with fractions, we multiply across the top and across the bottom. That's gonna give me three over three, which is just one, so that's awesome. Don't forget that you have to multiply that three by every single part of the problem. So this three Y, it's not three Y anymore, it's nine Y. It's nine Y because we multiplied everything by three. The one third we just talked about, when I multiply by three is gonna become one. 19 times three is 57. Now I can add one to both sides, so nine y is 58. And I can divide by nine, so that's gonna give me that y equals 58 over nine. In algebra one, we do not ever want you 
to change a fraction to a mixed number. We always want you to leave it as an improper fraction. And most of the time when people change it to a mixed number, they mess up anyway. So I'm telling you, do less math. Simplify a fraction if it simplifies. But if it doesn't simplify, leave it as an improper fraction in simplest form. Okay. Two more. I know these notes are getting long. I promise they're almost over. If I want to move on number eight, if I want to move all of my n's to the same side, I'm going to subtract 5n. Well, 5n minus 5n is zero, so all that's left on the left is negative 9. 5n minus 5n is zero, so all that's left on the right is, is 71. Okay, something like an alarm should be going off in your head right now. Something weird is happening. What's going on? I don't have any more variables. So the first thing you should do is go back, make sure you did your math right. We did our math right. Now, this should be setting off some alarms in your head. Is this true? Does negative 9 equal 71? Absolutely not. This is false. Because this is false, that means that there is no real solution, which you are more than welcome to abbreviate as NRS, or if you like drawing those squiggles, you can draw those squiggles and just leave the inside of them totally empty, the empty set. Nothing could possibly solve this problem. So this is a special case. We're gonna come back and talk about special cases in just a minute. Okay, number nine. W minus 5 divided by 9 equals 2W divided by 9. Oh, I could get rid of that. I don't like this fraction. I could get rid of divided by 9 if I just multiply everything by 9. So over here, those 9s are going to divide out. We're going to have W minus 5. On this side, 9 times 2W is going to give me 18W. I'm going to subtract w on both sides so that's going to give me negative 5 equals 17 w and i'm going to divide by 17 so that's going to give me that w equals negative 5 over 17. look i just used the symmetric property i flipped my w again it's okay to have a fraction as your answer it's okay that it's not a pretty fraction doesn't make it wrong okay we're at the end we're going to distribute here on number 10. Remember, when you distribute fractions, you're just change your constant or your number that's not a fraction. Just rewrite it as a fraction. Then you're just multiplying across the top and across the bottom. Well, this is 12 over 3, and that's 4. This is 6x over 3, and that's 2x. And we didn't change anything on the right. Now I'm going to add 2x to both sides. That's going to give me just 4 over here, and that's going to give me just 4 over here. Wait a second. What's going on? All of our variables went away. What did I ask myself last time? When all the variables go away, I always ask myself the question, is what's left true or false? Well, here, this is true. 4 does equal 4. Does equal four. What this means is that the answer is all real numbers, which you can use this fancy notation for, but we're going to talk more about that notation in Unit 2. What that means is you could plug in negative 1,000, 2, 0, 15, 30. All of those numbers are going to work. Every possible number could be plugged in for x and will give you a true statement. Okay, I'm going to do 11. I'm going to do it quickly. This video is getting way too long. I'm going to subtract 2n on both sides. That's going to give me 3n. 5n minus 2n is 3n plus 1 half equals 6. I'm going to multiply everything in this equation to get rid of my fraction. So 3n becomes 6n, 1 half becomes 1, 6 becomes 12. I'm going to subtract 1, so 6n equals 11. I'm going to divide by 6, so n equals 11 over 6. To summarize those special cases, what happens when we get two numbers that are not equal? That would mean that we have an equation that is false, so there's not a single value of x that works, which means this would be no real solution. What happens when we solve them and we get something that is true? If it's true and the left side equals the right side, then the solution is that every possible number could be plugged in and it would work. And that we can say all real numbers, which I'm going to say ARN for right now. So I hope that this video was helpful, that you reviewed how to solve an equation, that you understand the properties and what it means to solve and justify. Thanks for listening.